I'm a patriarch of science. Come to me for guidance. Black Rick licorice. Why do I feel like black licorice today? There's a person who died of black licorice. That's a true story. Black licorice has a toxin. And if you eat too much of it, if you eat like bags a day, you can die of eating black licorice. That's true. I went to CVS and the guy who was checking out next to me was buying condoms. And I honestly thought to myself, who's going to have the better night? The guy buying condoms or the guy staying late at work away from his family to read a paper about cytoplasmic incompatibility? Who's having the better night? <laughs> I think it's an honest, it, 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 it's, it's up for grabs, literally. Well, it's going to be a late night because a complicated paper dropped and I have to read it. So we got the beer. We got the whiskey. Oh. Oh. If you ever have to work late, whiskey helps. That's for damn sure. If you drink too much beer, you get tired. If you drink whiskey, just a little bit, enough, you get a bump. You get a bump in energy. That was my secret during my postdoc years. <laughs> Does Mark know that? <laughs> not going to lie. Not going to lie. I wouldn't lie to you guys. Here's what we're looking at. Let's go in. Test. One, two, three. Test. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, you can. I am. I am John Beckman, Professor John Beckman, Dr. John Beckman, the father of Sid. Sid, the transgender bender mother of sin. Your hostess with the mostest. Get a green screen in the back. Hopefully it doesn't turn black. Have my brain tied behind my back. Just to make it fair. <sighs> Fuck. Ooh. This stuff is raunchy. All right. I'm very excited to read this paper. And there are some big names in the CI field on this paper. Benjamin Lappin has studied a lot of early embryogenesis phenotypes. And I remember famously reading his review. And I actually remember, I think the title, the title was very memorable. It was something like, um, speaking of condoms, <laughs> it was something like the intimate genetics of Drosophila fertilization. Let's check that. Damn right. I was correct. That's the title. And look, that's the same that's the same, okay, so it's the same uh, senior author on this review. Look, Harard, Harard, and Lapin, Lapin. And then we know, we know Landman, Frederick Landman, who was a postdoc in Sullivan's lab, and much of the best, the best cytology of CI um, has been captured by Frederick Landman. And we know... Matthew Sicard, 
who is a co-author on the Toxin Antidote Hypothesis review paper. If you want to read that, go check it out. Bing. Um, so a lot of people, famous people on this paper, and I have a lot of respect for these people. They take a couple hits at me. They, they, they're... They take a couple hits at me, but I like them. I, I like these people. I have great respect for these people. So that's okay. That's okay. Well, we'll let's, let's go through. Let's look at, let's look at their paper um, and, and let's discuss this. They also, and they're not, they're not only just punching me, but they're all, they're also punching a little bit of the bottle steam. <laughs> uh, I drink from the steins of my enemies, the bottle steins of my enemies. I had no idea this paper was coming out or it was in, in submission. I had no idea this was being done. Um, I guess I kind of knew. I mean, like I kind of knew because a while back they asked for the flies and I saw I actually got a thank you. I saw I got a thank you. So a while back they asked for the flies. Um, I can't remember who asked me for the flies, but I sent them. I always, if people ask me, I always send, I always send my reagents and I'm, I, it's always really nice to see somebody utilizing the reagents that you build. So I'm happy about that. I'm really happy that I think they're able to use the reagents and get, get some success from that. So I, I like that. It's good that the work that you put in can help the field. That's a good feeling. All right, let me take a look at this figure. And let's take a look at quickly at their, their main highlights. Highlights. Uh. Sid A and Sid B function as a toxin antidote system. Gotta like that, baby. Sid A and Sid B associate in male germ cells until spermiogenesis. That makes sense because they bind. Sid B toxin is loaded into sperm nuclei in transgenic flies and infected Culex. That's good confirmation. We had always that hypothesis, but nobody had confirmed that. So this is a good, that's a confirmation that our predictions in the past were correct. So again, here, if you watch this channel, if you watch this channel, you're going to be ahead of the curve. I have to compliment my viewers. I have to say, I have about 500, 500 or so subscribers now. And I have to say, my subscribers are not only the smartest, not only the most intelligent, not only the most wise, and not only the most clever, but they're also the most attractive. And they're also always ahead of the curve. Because predictions that, that, that are made here on this channel tend to come true. So if you watch my channel, you're going to be ahead of the curve. Hit like, hit share, hit subscribe. Ah, take a drink. This is ridiculous. Tuesday night. You know, I just had a baby. I literally just had a baby, number six. And if you ask me, do you want to be at home with the new baby? Or do you want to be reading papers about CI? Uh, I love you, Shauna, but I got to read the paper on CI. It's my job. <laughs> I do love babies, though. SIDB associates with replication stress markers on paternal chromosomes. Not quite sure what that means. Excited to dig into it. So this paper is coming on um, a top of kind of like a mountain of papers over and over and over coming out, slaughtering the two by one cup model. And it seems like this paper is again, another paper. This is the third paper recently to come out very recently, all within the span of three months to just slaughter and obliterate the two by one cup model. So if you're still buying into the two by one cup model, you're behind the curve. I'm gonna say that you're behind the curve and there might be something wrong with you. <laughs> but hey, you can think what you want, that's fine. Everybody has the entitled to their own opinions. Is everybody entitled to their own facts? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe if you buy into the two by one cup model. So it looks like what's happening here is a localization study. I avoided specifically, purposefully, I avoided studying localization of SID 
and sin molecules, proteins, for years because I did not want to do this. I felt like this was very difficult and I did not, I did not want to be the one doing it because I knew it would be difficult. So I avoided it for years, although it always, it needed to be done. So I'm really excited to see, see the results. Um, and it's being done by, I think, one of the best people for it. I, I definitely think this team is the best team, one of the best teams for this job. So if you look at their figure abstract, the graphical abstract, you're seeing a postulation that is sort of a, inherent to the TA model. If you understand TA systems, TA systems are abundant in biology. They are abundant in prokaryotic organisms, bacteria, and you find them on plasmid systems. So you find TA systems, which typically involve two genes on plasmids and their selection mechanisms that select for the plasmid. Essentially what happens is they are addiction modules that addict the organism to the plasmid. And if a daughter organism does not inherit the plasmid with the TA system, it'll kill the cell. Now, let me explain how this happens. If here's a E. coli cell, here's a plasmid with the TA module. What happens with the TA module is they make both what's called blue antidotes. They make antidotes and they also make toxins called red toxin. They make them at the same time because typically these systems are organized as two gene operons with a promoter on the five prime side. They get transcribed typically as a polycystronic message. It's translated simultaneously into two proteins. And the two proteins typically in a type two toxin antidote system where proteins, the antidote is a protein and the toxin is a protein, they bind together immediately. So in an E. coli cell, a TA plasmid will create cytoplasm that looks like this. Now, when the daughter divides, when the mother divides into two daughters, the cytoplasm becomes shared. So some of these toxin antidote proteins are gonna move to the new cell, okay? Through binary fission. Through binary fission, some of the TA pairs are going to move into the two cells. Now, what happens? What happens if daughter cell number two does not inherit the plasmid? What happens is the antidote degrades, the toxin is activated, activated, and the cell is killed. And so the only cell left over is the daughter cell that inherits the plasma. So this creates a selective mechanism where only E. coli that inherit the plasmid survive in the next generation. So it skews inheritance and selects for inheritance of the TA system through a killing mechanism. These are common, as I said, in bacterial systems. This is common. If we think that CI evolved from one of these systems, that is not a core premise, but it's one of my central hypotheses that underlies the TA architecture is I think CI evolved from one of these systems. And I'm doing some work on that to hopefully come out, explain a little bit more of that in the future. But that is what is being described in this top part of this abstract. Exactly what I just described for you, they are describing in this abstract of how CI works. You have Wolbachia, they secrete the toxin bound to the antidote simultaneously. During spermiogenesis, the antidote is degraded, which activates the toxin. Then in the embryo, if the embryo does not have the antidote, It'll kill the cell. It'll fuck up the cell. It's the same mechanism. So I'm assuming they have data that now 
supports this, which was um, which was until now an assumption of the TA model, that degradation step where the toxin becomes active, that was in the past an assumption, looks like now it is supported by data. So let me take a look at their introduction and let's see if I can pull out some key points. So one of the first key points that they describe in the introduction is the classical CI cytology, where if you have a Drosophila embryo that was just fertilized by a sperm, a couple things happen in a CI cross that you need to know about. One is that chromosomes from the father stay separate from chromosomes from the female. So chromosomes from the father's sperm are separate at the first division in Drosophila or in insects from the chromosomes of the mother. The second thing you need to know that you see in CI crosses is when the embryo goes through mitosis, the chromosomes need to condense to be able to divide, okay? And so what happens is female chromosomes, the mother's chromosomes look normal, but the father's chromosomes don't condense properly. And they kind of look like this. It's kind of like a tangled mess. So then when the cell divides at the first mitotic division, the mother's chromosomes can be pulled apart but the father's chromosomes cannot be untangled and they get ripped apart and the embryo dies. You should all know this if you're watching my CI playlist, but it's key knowledge for this paper. Second key point, second key point is this process is conserved across insects. You can take Wolbachia from one insect, put it in a different insect, and you still see this, you still see this same cytology. So the process is conserved, which means that the targets of CI are conserved. Third key premise is that we now know the genes that cause this process are two genes, two loci. Some people call them SIFs, CI factors, some people call them by another name. So SIFs, SIF A and SIF B induce CI somehow. Now there's various models as we all know, and that's what this paper is addressing. Fourth key premise, the TA model, strict TA model posits that the gene SIF B alone is toxin that induces CI, and SIF A alone is antidote. And this is debated, although perhaps no longer anymore, but this was debated by the two by one cup model. There are some other models. Another model would be the host modification model, which we have discussed. The host modification model would be that a gene does something to the chromosome, some effect, which can then be reversed. And it's different from the TA model because it does not have to be two genes. It does not have to be a toxin and an antidote. And it does not have to involve binding for rescue. Now, host modification model is already not very supported because we know from the Hochstrasser and the structures, we because we know now from the structures, which I have a discussion on that paper, we know now from the structures, the structural experiments, that binding is required for rescue. So this is already sort of like an unfavored model. And two by one cup model is already an unfavored model. Look above in the playlist if you doubt this. A final assumption that the TA model posits is that SIF B is present, physically present in sperm. These are sort of key assumptions now supported by data, much data in the TA model. 
But until this paper, nobody had any data, any published data about localization of these proteins. Okay. Now, in this presentation, I am not going to call them SIFs. I'm going to call them by their true name, the SIDs, because that's what's being studied. So I'm going to call these SID A and SID B, which are named for CI inducing deubiquitylase. So I'm going to call them that from now on in this paper. So the first test, test one, is express SID A and SID B in insect cells. So it looks like the first thing they do is they made fluorescent proteins. So it looks like they made SID B green with SFGFP. And it looks like they made SID A red with MK. I never heard that one before. So they got a red A and a green B. Let's take a gander at the data. So they're using one ORF open reading frame with a T2A fusion construct to split the ORFs in translation. And one of the key things is they're mapping, they're mapping localization in interphase versus mitosis. So two different cellular stages, interphase and mitosis. So in this data, in interphase, they're in the cytoplasm. In mitosis, they're in the nucleus. And it looks like they're in the same spot. They're overlapping. So it looks like they're bound. Then they split them apart. Huh. You can already see it. I don't. I haven't even read the results. You can see it. When A is by itself, it looks like it goes. I'm guessing it goes to the chromatin. And when B is by itself, it just flat out fucks up the cell and kills the cell. It looks totally fucked up. So it looks like just expressing Sid B by itself is just inherently toxic, which is what. Again, we've been arguing for so long. So it's good to see this. Good to see this. Here's the data that they that people will presume I don't like, which is when they make the C1025A mutant, that's a dead dub. So the C1025A mutant is a dead dub. They still see the killing. They're still seeing killing. What do I think of, let me, let me read what they, let me read what they say about it before I say stuff. Okay, there's a key thing that I missed. Here's the one key thing that I missed. SIDB alone is in the nucleus in both interphase and mitosis. SIDA plus SIDB is dynamic. In interphase, it's in the cytoplasm these this complex but in mitosis the complex is in the nucleus so the conclusion here is that sid a is regulating the localization of sid b sid a regulates localization of sid b this is great i don't disagree with this at all and in fact in the e life paper the beckman e life paper we explicitly in writing argue this because when the complex is bound together, the interactions that the protein complex is interacting with is a bunch of cytoplasmic things. And it's completely different than when SIDB is alone. When SIDB is alone, it's interacting with chromatin things. We explicitly argue that. So these data are, I don't have any problem with this data at all. I think it's good. It's well supported. So let's compile a list of important conclusions. SID A regulates localization of SID B. I love that. Conclusion two, SID B alone is very toxic. I love that. Three, SID A rescues cytotoxicity of SID B. I love that. 
This is all supporting TA. And they say here exactly what I was pointing out. I agree. The behavior of SID A and SID B in Drosophila cells is similar to bacterial type 2 toxin antitoxin system. I agree. <laughs> Here's what they think I'm going to get mad. I see. That's a good control. Okay. I think that's a good experiment. I think that's a good control. Who are they citing? Comander and Wahlberger. Okay, these are good people. So here's what they see. Four, Sid B, Sid B's toxicity is independent of the dub. And I don't like that. <laughs> but I don't doubt their data. Let's look at their data. I don't, I'm not doubting their data at all. Here's the Sid B, this right here. Here's the Sid B C1025A. And it's still fucking up the cells. Like, that's pretty clear. And here's this other control mutation. It's still fucking up the cells. So I'm not doubting the data, but let me add some nuance here. Let's add some nuance. In yeast, C1025A does inhibit toxicity. So questions. Is there something about S2 cells? Alternatively, is there something unique about embryos and sperm? Certainly that's true. Certainly. Are the systems all cross compatible? Should we expect the same results? Exactly. Should we expect the same results? I don't know. I, I'm not sure. I'll, I'll read more and let me, let me think about this more. These are things I need to think about with this paper. But I don't doubt the data. I don't doubt the data at all. Is the construct similar? You got these tags now. One reason I avoided localization is because we felt that tags were affecting functionality. I should say, I should clarify. One reason we avoided large tags like fluorescent proteins is we felt they were affecting functionality. So this is a beautiful experiment. So then what they do is they take, they take my construct, they take my flies, so then test, what am I phrasing these as? Test or question? Test two. Take Beckman lines, flies. This is V5, SID A, flag, SID B with the T2A and express them in salivary glands. So Drosophila salivary glands are famous for polyteen chromosomes. The famous example is the heat shock proteins. When you heat shock salivary gland proteins, you can actually see like the expression of heat shock genes open up in the polyteen chromosomes and, and you can get great pictures. So salivary glands are famous in Drosophila for studying chromatin, studying chromosomes, because they, in the salivary glands, think what the salivary glands do. The salivary glands, what they do is they their function is to express boatloads of protein and excrete it into the saliva. So they expand their chromosomes so that they can actually produce more messenger RNA. They become polyploid, produce more messenger RNA and produce more protein for the function of the salivary glands. So it's actually a famous system and a beautiful idea, a beautiful idea to try to take these lines. These are UAS, GAL4 UAS lines and express them in salivary glands and see what happens visually. I think it's a beautiful idea. I never thought of that. Kudos, that's a, that's a great idea. Here's that. Let's see if I can figure out what's going on. These are nuclei. These are cytoplasm. So the conclusions here is they like the complex binds chromatin. That's pretty clear. These are the, these are the famous Drosophila salivary polyteen chromosomes. And SID A and SID B are co-localizing at the chromosomes, which makes sense. But they also saw cells where they were cytoplasmic. So I'm not sure what to make of this data. They see complex binding to chromatin, but they also see the complex binding or in cytoplasm. What does that mean? They just say their conclusion is, they just say it confirms an ability to bind chromatin. But beyond that, they leave it there. Test three, 
Same experiment in testes. All right, let's take a look at these. They're definitely binding sperm DNA. So let's add to our conclusions. They bind DNA in polyteen chromosomes and sperm. I like that. Supports all our hypotheses. This is nice. Look at these. I need to make like a poster of this and like hang it on my wall. It's super pretty, super beautiful. The other thing I'm just going to say, like, I'm just going to say the other thing that's nice is if you can get immunofluorescence data that looks this damn good from constructs that I built and had the foreknowledge knowing that localization was going to be important to put these V5 and these flag tags on there. I got to say that makes me feel good because anytime you create a reagent that is working for other people, it's a really good feeling. So I'm just super happy that reagent that I made is being used in the community and is, is working. They're doing things that I couldn't do. I couldn't do this. But at least I had the foresight to know that people would want to do this, and I built it in. I should get a thank you for that. And they did thank me. Thank you for thanking me. So let's look at this. What they're noting is that Sid A and B are being expressed abundantly in cytoplasm of germ cells. But look at Sid A. So Sid B, so, th so they're looking at localization over period of spermatogenesis. And they're seeing cytoplasmic localization of A and B complex in the cytoplasm of germ cells. But then when they get to the adult spermatid stage, which you can see from these long, fine, fibrous chromatin, you can see that Sid B is present longer on the sperm chromatin than Sid A. Look closely at this. Sid A is really kind of like only left in this spot, whereas Sid B is kind of here, 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 and here. So you're starting to see a reduction in Sid A in late spermatogenesis. Let's put that in our conclusions. Sid A begins to disappear in late spermatogenesis. Disappear. And it stays late even after the histone protamine transition. So here is fluorescent tagged protamines. And when there's protamines in the sperm, Sid B is also still in the sperm. But how come they don't have a Sid A in this panel? Like it would be nice to see if the Sid A is like totally gone. How come that's not in here? How the fuck do you spell disappear? Two P's. That's weird. Sid B is another conclusion. Sid B remains even after protamine transition. That's very late adult mature sperm i think i like that love that i like that love that it's pretty impressive to see this i i kind of thought this might be impossible it's impressive to see this data so the fact that they're seeing degradation totally supports the ta model where the antidote has to get degraded I like that. Test four, localization in early embryos. So it looks like this is a CI cross, transgenic CI cross. And it looks like they're mapping and following the male and the female paternal chromosome. Blue looks like DAPI. So blue is DNA. There's no green at all, no green, which means A is not, doesn't make it to the embryo, but there is still some red. And this is what's nice. There's only red in the male, not in the female. So this confirms eight, Sid B is transferred to embryos in the sperm, chromatin. 
I like that. I love that. PCA is a mark. PCNA is a marker of DNA replication. And so they're saying that SIDB is still hanging around when the DNA is trying to be replicated for that first mitosis. Okay, so here's the next thing I'm not going to like. So they took the mutant. We have a 1025A mutant, C1025A dub mutant line that I built. And they turned it on, and I guess they see full sterility. Comments on this. I never did that experiment. I never did that because the basal expression of the active dub construct gave full CI. And the basal expression of C1025A dub gave no CI at all, which is why I never tested turning them on. An inconvenient truth. I guess. I don't know. Okay, but there's nuance here. There's some nuance here. Figure four. The nuance is that it's the mutant, the dub mutant, is barely present in spermatids. And they think this means that the dub is important for localization. Let me put that in our conclusions their conclusions. The nuance to this is that the mutant is not localizing like the wild type. They conclude that the dub is important for localization. Now, interestingly, they would not be the first people to conclude that. Actually, uh, Toshiyuki Harumoto, interestingly, in spiroplasma, there is a dub, an OTU, type dub, given the name of spade, spade induces male killing, and it has a dub domain. And Toshiyuki concluded in this paper in Nature that the dub was important for localization of that reproductive manipulator. So interestingly, they would not be the first to make that conclusion. Did they cite this paper? They should have cited this paper. I mean, Toshiyuki essentially concluded the same thing, which is interesting. Um, one question I do have here is how much are they overexpressing when they saw that C1025A gave full CI? How much are they overexpressing? Wait a minute, what? The other thing they say is that not only did the mutant not localize well in the sperm, but it almost disappeared completely in the embryo. Two Ps. And for fuck's sake. And at the onset of the first division in these zygotes that are overexpressing the C1025, excuse me, at the onset of the first division in these zygotes that were mated from males that were overexpressing the C1025A dead dub, paternal chromosomes appeared mildly affected compared to the situation of wild type and did not show detectable replication stress. So without the dub, without the dub, they are not getting the full CI cytology. So I don't know how you reconcile, I don't know how you reconcile this. They're saying that when they turn it on with a super, super, super strong driver, I think they see like complete CI with the dead dub with a strong driver. But then when they look at the CI cytology, they're not getting full CI cytology. I don't know how to reconcile that. Oh, but they still formed the bridges, but they're still forming the bridges. Their conclusion is, let's write their conclusion. Their conclusion is that the C1025A retains CI capability, but doesn't work as well. Doesn't localize as well. Maybe, I don't know. I'm gonna have to think about this. Let's ponder. Okay, and then the test five. The test five is then they do some immunofluorescence in Culex. And I'm presuming the patterns look the same, but I'm tired. All right, discussion. And then we need to bring up the ponder points. Let me check out the discussion. 
So one of their hypotheses is that SID B, which is a dub, in the late adult sperm and early embryo might get ubiquitilated. And that could signal it for degradation by the proteasome. And the fact that it's a dub could potentially remove these ubiquitin modifications, preventing it from being degraded. So SIDB's substrate, dub substrate, would then be itself. That's one hypothesis that they're proposing. The dub is possibly preventing SIDB from being degraded. Oh, that's pretty. Shit, the Culex figures are pretty. I'm tired, though. It's late. That's nice. That's nice. <laughs> Although that's, uh, this is interesting. So what they're saying is, I detected SID A in mosquito sperm thicae, which initiated the targeting of these genes in the 2013 study. And they're saying, they're saying that the SID A in those sperm thicae could be of maternal origin. It would be interesting if the mosquito is already getting ready to rescue SID A or, or to rescue CI by like loading SID A into almost like the sperm thicae. Who knows? Like maybe, maybe that's actually how rescue works. Maybe SID A is loaded into the sperm thicae. I don't, it's an interesting hypothesis. Like I'm not against that hypothesis. One, one, one way to rescue CI would be to overexpress it in the eggs. And clearly that does work because the transgenic Drosophila, you overexpress SID A in the eggs and it will rescue. So I don't think it would be required that SID A would be loaded into the sperm and thicae to get rescue, but it would be an interesting hypothesis and you could test it. I still don't think, like, I don't think that the SID A that I found is of maternal origin. One, and like, I've, people have asked me this and I've talked about this. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. But when you dissect out sperm and thicae from mosquitoes, they're essentially like eggshells, like they're, they're sclerotized. There is like corian on the spermatheke. And if you smash them, they crack, they crack open like eggshells releasing, releasing like thousands of sperm. And so I say this because I don't think that there's a lot of cellular tissue around here for like Wolbachia to infect. So I don't know how SID A would like get there. If you look at a mosquito, if you look at like a female mosquito, here's her abdomen, here's her head. The ovaries are up here. And the spermatheke are here. And the Wolbachia, are like up here, like these are physically distant. They're physically distant. Now I'm not saying it's impossible. Like it's not impossible for Wolbachia here to secrete SID A and SID A would somehow get to the spermatheca. It's not impossible. Maybe that's what I detected. I don't know. It's not impossible. But I don't like that idea because in my experience, when you stain for Wolbachia, like you see them up here and you don't see them down here in the spermatheke. And like I said, there's not a lot of tissue. There's not a lot of tissue in the spermatheke. They're like eggshells, but there has to be some passage under which they're connected. So I don't know, like, I don't know. Who knows? I certainly don't know the answer. All I know is I detected that motherfucker first. That's what I know. Uh, that's all I know. I don't know. 
It could, who knows? This is important. I really like this line. I really like this line. Paternal transmission of SIDB to the fertilized egg is central prediction of the TA model, which is now validated. People have had discussions with me. People have had discussions with me about in the past when TA did not have so much support, when I was on the ropes and everybody was doubting me. We had discussions and the reason that I always stuck with the TA model was because the TA model makes predictions. It made predictions about the biology of the system that always came true. It made predictions that there would be two loci. There are two loci. It made predictions that they would be an operon. They are an operon. It made predictions that they would be evolved from a toxin antidote from a plasmid. And you can find CIF operons on plasmid. It made predictions that the two antidote and toxin would bind to each other. And that is true. That came true. And it's made a prediction, according to the TA model, that the SIDB had to get transferred in the sperm to the egg. And nobody had data to support that for years. For the last 10 years, nobody has had data to support that. But that was a central prediction that was made by the TA model, which is now validated. So one of the reasons why TA is king, and I said this to Shropshire, I said this to Shropshire, the reason that TA is king of all the models is because there's like 10 fucking things that TA model predicted that are true, that came true, that were tested and their data supports them. And so I'm just happy to see this. Like even if, even if the dub, if the dub is instead important for localization, like I don't care because I was still right. Like, sure. Like you can't be right about everything. And I don't know. I still don't know. Like, I still debate it. One reason I still debate. So, okay. So now let's get into the, the inconvenient truth, pondering the inconvenient truth, pondering is dub essential for CI. I think in this paper, in this paper, I think they're making the right conclusion from their data. But I do think you have to remember that the context of CI is not just Drosophila, and Culex, the context of CI is many, many, many things. The context of CI is many different insects. And so am I willing to toss out the idea that the dub is essential for CI? No, I'm not gonna toss that out yet. And there's still evidence to support that, right? Like in yeast, the dub is, I'm like actively pondering this as you watch me. Here's what I'll say. Here's what I'll say. I am open to the idea that the dub contributes to CI through localization. I am open to that. But I think people are, if you're just to read this, I think you're going to miss, I think you're going to underestimate. I'm going to say, but don't underestimate the role of the dub. I'm going to say that this, these CI mechanisms are complicated. We don't know all the answers. We're only just at the beginning of this. We don't have all the answers. And I'm going to be open. I'm still open to the dub centrality. But I'm also open to other ideas. You got any? Fuck, two fucking hours. Two fucking hours on this shit. I'm still not even done reading the discussion. One reason I like this and I'm not upset by it is because I'm so confident in uh, Toshiyuki Haramoto. I'm so confident in Toshi. I'm so confident in Toshi's ability to do science, and I'm so confident in Toshi's data that I would honestly like the idea. I would like the idea that Spade 
and Sid B behave similarly. Like if if it's true that the dub is being used to pre- to improve localization and to prevent degradation of these effectors in two separate reproductive manipulations from two separate bacteria, I would love that. I think that would be amazing. So it's one reason why, like, I actually think this idea is sexy. I think this is idea is sexy. And one reason it's really sexy is because it suggests that there's convergent evolution between spiroplasma spade and Wolbachia sit. So I like it. And to me, it actually makes the dub more central, more central to reproductive parasitism, because if it's at the core of localization of the effectors from spiroplasma and Wolbachia, that to me is sexy. So I like that. Like, I am not opposed to this, but I'll still say, again, reiterate, don't underestimate the role of the dub. We're going to learn a lot in the next 10 years, in the next decade, and we'll see. We'll see. I'm a patriarch of science. Come to me for guidance. Get out the way. 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 I'm a man and a king. I wear the fucking ring. I discovered Sydney, so fuck with me. I fecundity is high, and I don't fucking lie. I'm a patriarch of science. Come to me for guidance. Come to me for guidance. Get out the way. 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 I'm a patriarch of science. Come to me for guidance.